Hi there everybody and welcome to a lecture on the digestive system. Uh, we are going to run through this thing top to bottom and see how far I get uh, in the time I've got allowed. Uh, my guess is I'm probably going to do this in two parts. So let's do about half of this and we'll run through and do the rest. We'll see how we feel once we get past the stomach. Alright, so the digestive system. The idea is very simple. You consume food. That food contains all of the nutrients and general materials that you need to survive and uh, do the things that you do on a daily basis. But in order for you to get those nutrients and energetic molecules and important things into your cells, you got to take that thing, you got to break it down. Uh, the way that your book phrases it is it's, it says that your digestive system is a disassembly line. You can imagine an assembly line putting things together. Well, your digestive system is a disassembly line. It's going to be constantly taking things apart, taking big things and bringing them into smaller, smaller, smaller parts. The idea is you have to get these very complex molecules from the foods that you consume. You have to break those down into their most simple, minor constituent parts so that they can then be absorbed into your cells, crossing uh, cell membranes, moving in uh, so that you can do the things that you do. So... In and amongst this, we have a few conversations to have. First things first, your intestines are based off of the movement of materials from top to bottom through your GI tract or gastrointestinal tract. Uh, the idea here is that your GI tract is a continuous tube from your mouth to your anus. Okay, one end to the next, a full-on continuous tube. In fact, uh, this is considered external. Uh, the materials you consume are not necessarily entering into your bodily tissues, provided they stay in the alimentary canal or the GI tract. Uh, they are moving from one end to the next, and if they are moving through there, that means something for us. And what that means is that your GI tract is highly muscular. Okay, you got lots of smooth muscle in your GI tract, allowing you to propel uh, foodstuffs from one place to the next. And when we say propel foodstuffs from one place to the next, what we're really talking about is peristalsis. Peristalsis is a very, very important term for us. This is that set of rhythmic contractions. It's going to propel materials from one end of a tube to the next. Uh, your esophagus does this. Your stomach kind of does this. Your intestines certainly do this. Heck, your ureters do this in your urinary system. Peristaltic motion, that act of Propelling materials down the length of a tube is very, very important for general concepts of the function of your digestive system. Now, in the realm of digestion, we've got a few things to talk about here. Uh, you can kind of break digestion down into four steps. Ingestion, that's taking food in via the mouth, all right? You eat things, that is ingestion. Digestion, that will be breaking things down into their more simplistic subunits, okay? Uh, now, this can be done in two phases. These are mechanical and chemical. Uh, imagine when you take a bite of food and you're chewing that up. That's going to be a um, mechanical form of digestion. So you're breaking things down into smaller to smaller pieces uh, by chewing on them and then along the way you will also undertake chemical digestion uh, that will be utilizing enzymes like amylase and lipase and what have you uh, that will help to break those food stuffs down into their smaller chemical subunits um, your chemical digestion is based off of hydrolysis reactions that's absolutely true this is going to be enzymatic and we're going to be breaking things down by adding water to the molecules so you add water to the molecule, that hydrolyzes it, and it breaks it down from complex to more simplistic subunits. Uh, third here, we have absorption. So once we have mechanically broken down food and then chemically broken down that food, we move on to absorbing the nutrients from this, uh, these foodstuffs. Okay? So this is going to be material moving across the, uh, the membranes of your cells, getting into your bloodstream, getting into your cells to do the things that you need them to do. So absorption is incredibly important here and primarily accomplished by your small intestine. Okay, If I ask you where absorption takes place, that's the small intestine. Right? Very important, uh, specifically certain areas of it. We're going to get to that here in a second. And then last but not least, we have elimination. That is the production of and then release of 
uh, fecal materials, feces, okay? This is going to be done primarily by the large intestine. So what the large intestine does is it basically pulls water out, out of what will become feces and compacts things down into little morsels, if you will, that can then be released from the body um, actively when we so choose. So ingestion, digestion, absorption, and elimination. Let's continue. Uh, digestion... Uh, function. So mechanical digestion and chemical digestion, I'd like to go into just a, a little bit more detail on this. Uh, so mechanical digestion is where we're going to be taking bites of materials and sort of chewing those up and breaking them down into smaller parts. Uh, that basically increases the surface area of whatever foodstuffs you're bringing in, which can then facilitate for chemical digestion. Uh, so we do mechanical digestion in the mouth, absolutely. So when we're biting off pieces of food and chewing them up, that's most certainly mechanical digestion. But also built into this is sort of the activity of the stomach. So in the stomach, you've got this uh, kind of churning, grinding motion that certainly drives mechanical digestion. And then to a small degree also in the small intestine. So you're going to see that in your small intestines, the activities of the uh, muscle that's there can certainly play a role in, in sort of distributing materials, which in the grand scheme is mechanical digestion. All right, chemical digestion, these are based off of hydrolysis reactions. Uh, this is going to be conducted by enzymes, and chemical digestion starts in the mouth, uh, works in the stomach as well, but it's almost entirely going to be done in the small intestine. All right, the small intestine plays a huge, huge role in chemical digestion, so this really, really matters to us here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm pretty happy with that. So we're going to go into more detail on this a little bit later on. So we're going to be talking about nutrients uh, in the next set of lectures. Uh, but generally speaking, big sugars are broken down into smaller sugars, polysaccharides to monosaccharides. Proteins broken down into amino acids. Uh, fats are broken down into their more minor subunits. You can imagine like a triglyceride being broken down into glycerols and fatty acids. Uh, and then big nucleic acids broken down into individual nucleotides. Very few things are brought in ready to be absorbed. Uh, free amino acids, things like cholesterol molecules, small things tend to have abilities to get in uh, more so. But generally speaking, the foods that we consume have to be broken down to make their way into our system. Now, there are two groups of organs here. Uh, these are broken into the alimentary canal and the accessory uh, di digestive organs. And I'm going to show you another slide on this in a second. Man, I'm here to tell you, different books classify these in different ways. Uh, we as humans love putting things in little boxes, and this is certainly one of those times. So you can expect me not to be asking you a huge number of questions about what's an accessory organ and what's an alimentary canal uh, direct organ. Okay. So let's just run through and have the conversation. So your alimentary canal is about 30 feet from mouth to anus. Uh, the idea is that in this process, traveling down these tubes, uh, you will be digesting and then absorbing foods and then eliminating them from your system. Uh, there is a order to this, if I already presented it. No, I have it. It's on the next slide. Uh, but I will, um, I I'm going to go over the order of things as we progress here in just a second. Uh, but this sort of outlines it here. So, well, what the heck? So mouth into pharynx, pharynx down the esophagus, esophagus to the stomach, which is here, uh, stomach to small intestines, small intestines to large intestine, large intestine out the anal opening. All right. Uh, and again, like I'm going to give you a little bit more detail on that here in just a second. In the realm of accessory digestive organs, uh, the teeth, tongue, and gallbladder are in and amongst this. You know, teeth and tongue... Uh, many texts, and the way that I learned this, classify the teeth and the tongue as part of the mouth. So, you know, where they fall, it's an irritation. Uh, but generally speaking, accessory organs, the gallbladder is very important to this. Uh, you have various digestive glands that are certainly accessory organs. Uh, salivary glands are an example of this. But more importantly, and where we're going to spend our time, man, is talking about the liver and the pancreas. The liver here and the pancreas sort of back behind, underneath the stomach, if you will, uh, play a huge role as accessory digestive organs uh, in helping you break down food specifically in chemical fashion. Let's continue. So here is where I really wanted to be. So what I'm trying to give you here is accessory organs on one side and the main digestive tract organs on the opposing side. Again, you can see your glands, your liver, your gallbladder, your pancreas. 
uh, the gallbladder being part and parcel with the liver in ways I'll show you here in a second. Um, and then the major digestive tract organs being your mouth, your pharynx, uh, the esophagus traveling down, the stomach, which is a storage area, if you will, and sort of a primary processing portion. That's a lot of peas. Uh, the small intestine here, and then followed by the large intestine. So, when you consume foods, they start at your mouth, uh, where you're going to begin chemical and mechanical digestion. You're going to pass that into the pharynx. From the pharynx, it's going to run down the esophagus into the stomach, uh, where a lot of churning happens uh, and sort of homogenizing of materials here, which is very important. From the stomach, we're going to run into the small intestine, from the small intestine out to the large intestine, and then out the anal opening, from the rectum, if you will, down to the anal opening. Uh, let's see, what all do I want to say here? The small intestine is where most chemical digestion and uh, absorption is going to eventually take place. The large intestine is primarily going to be for removing water, if you will, from the materials that you have consumed. Uh, the rectum is sort of a final storage area where you're going to build up materials and have them dry out and become fecal, uh, and then you're going to eliminate those through the anus. All right, before we move further off of this, I have a few things to talk about. First, uh, I want to point out this sort of set of images up here. You've seen these before in a previous lecture. Uh, what you see in the front there is the trachea, which is involved in breathing. And then on the back here, what we have is the esophagus. You need to understand that those tracheal rings are not full rings. They are C-shaped, which allows for you to eat foods that won't then kind of scrape into cartilage on the trachea. So it's a little bit of a nuance to this and how it works, but there it is. Uh, and further, on here, I want to show you the enteric nervous system. Uh, the enteric nervous system gets a lot of love. It's considered a semi-autonomous uh, nervous network. So this is going to be controlled by your autonomic nervous system for the most part, but it sort of has the ability to self-regulate as well. So you don't think about making your intestines move. This is done behind the scenes. You don't think about making your stomach move things around and churn materials. This is done behind the scenes autonomically, uh, but the enteric nervous system sort of has the ability to self-regulate itself. Uh, what you will find is, for instance, like your small intestines have pacemaking cells that allow for peristalsis to happen without nervous influence from above. All right, so this enteric nervous system is very important for sort of um, maintaining general function of the esophagus and the stomach and the intestines and sort of keeping things moving, keeping secretions where they need to be, uh, and just the general function of your uh, digestive system. So your, your brain's in control at the end of the day, but the enteric nervous system sort of maintains and keeps things running uh, without necessarily without cortical influence. All right, <clears throat> so here what we have are the layers of the GI tract, uh, and this looks like pretty much every other system that we've seen. What we have is a mucosa, uh, here mostly made out of um, simple cuboidal epithelium in a lot of cases. Uh, this mucosa is going to have lots of goblet cells in it, and the reason for this is we want lots of mucus. Okay, Lots and lots of mucus here, and this is going to sort of lubricate passages and allow things to move through easily. Further, this mucosa has a lot of villi, these bumps that are in it, and we'll be talking about this later, uh, but they dramatically increase the surface area of your, specifically the intestinal tract. But generally speaking, all areas of your GI tract are going to have this mucosal lining, followed by a submucosa. So the submucosa is going to contain, contain the blood vessels and things that are necessary for the absorption of nutrients from, uh, for instance, the small intestine here. Uh, so mucosa to submucosa, you've got a muscularis or a muscularis externi. So the, the muscularis portion of this typically is made up of two layers of smooth muscle. That would be a circular layer and a longitudinal layer. And again, what we're doing here is peristalsis. We're going to be able to squeeze off areas and pump things down the length. I will, however, point out that while almost the entirety of your uh, gastrointestinal tract is two layers of smooth muscle, the stomach has three. It gives it an extra layer for churning of materials. And then last but not least, there is always going to be a serosa on the outside of this. Uh, and this serosa is part of your uh, parietal and visceral peritoneum. 
okay? So the visceral peritoneum would be attached to the organs themselves, and the parietal peritoneum would be attached to the body wall, the, the abdominal cavity, if you will, around this. So there's certainly a serous membrane set here, just like everything else that we've talked about up to this stage. Good. All right, the anatomy of the mouth. So your mouth contains the teeth, okay? And uh, the teeth are very important for general what's called mastication or the act of chewing. So your teeth have functions. Let me see if I put functions of the teeth here uh, in any real details. Yes, I did. Okay, so we'll get to that in a second. I'll, I'll tell you about the functions of the teeth in mere moments. But generally speaking, for chewing, tearing off materials and chewing, uh, in here also you have the tongue. And the tongue is very important. It's like basically just a big muscle. And it's going to be used to manipulate foodstuffs and position it where it needs to be for you to chew. It's what you use your tongue for. And further, uh, your tongue has taste buds on it. And these taste buds are really important for your general health. Like, you have tried to consume foods before and couldn't physically swallow it, all right? You've, you've taken a bite of something and you knew something was wrong and you had to spit it out. Your taste buds are telling you um, when you are consuming foods that are beneficial versus when you are consuming foods that are not necessarily beneficial. Uh, boy, I would love to have a long conversation on why we think sugar tastes good. Uh, the long story short is that sugar is an incredibly high nutrient or high energy molecule, I should say, and our ancestors didn't have a lot of access to it. So we developed this taste, if you will, this appreciation, a love of sugar as a result of that. Now, when we consume food and we're chewing it up, what we do is we form what's called a bolus. A bolus is a mass of, uh, of consumed food. It's basically like a small ovoid mass. Now, you release two forms of saliva, a, a uh, serous secretion and a really thick mucosal uh, mucin-based secretion. And what you'll do is you'll use these two forms of um, saliva to form up dry materials, like imagine eating crackers, into a small little ovoid mass that the tongue then can position at the back of the throat and allow you to swallow. Okay, so if you look at this, actually I don't even have them labeled, you'll see them in a second. Uh, you have three pair of salivary glands, and the salivary glands not only release saliva, but they also release small amounts of salivary amylase that are going to help you break down certain carbohydrates like starch, and potentially lingual lipase. Okay, uh, this is thought of as being a very minor influence on lipid digestion, but it's found in the mouth, so here we are talking about it, all right? Salivary amylase certainly gets started in the mouth, uh, whereas lingual lipase uh, is, there's potential for it. All right, there's potential. Uh, let's see, what else do we want to say here? So we've got our tonsils back there that are early warning systems about bacteria coming into the oral cavity. You should be best friends with tonsils at this stage. Uh, and further, I will also point out that in the oral cavity, your mouth releases antibacterial agents. Key amongst these being lysozyme. All right, lysozyme uh, is an enzyme. It's actually called N-acetylmuramide glycanohydrolase. What a mouthful, no pun intended. And uh, lysozyme is a very potent antibacterial agent, not to mention that your salivary secretions are a little bit acidic. You'll, you, I'm going to give you more details on this here in just a second. This is the breakdown, uh, but, but very important all the same. So you have antibacterial agents in your mouth, uh, that do a good job at keeping a lot of the bad stuff out and sort of modulating the effects in the oral cavity. Now, your oral cavity is still awash in bacteria, obviously. That's why you have a bad taste in your mouth when you wake up, and sometimes you don't brush your teeth, your bre uh, breath smells bad, or you floss, and the floss smells disgusting. That's bacteria, okay? So there's still bacteria hanging out in there, but they're part of your natural flora, uh, and what this is going to do is it's going to keep more dangerous stuff out hopefully. Now, before I move on, I just want to point out one thing. That's this lingual frenulum down here, okay? Uh, your book was mentioning this, and uh, I feel like it's just worth your time to be aware of it. So, if you go to a mirror, pause the video, go to a mirror, and lift your tongue up and look at the base of it, and you'll see this uh, strand of connective tissue, if you will, that we're going to call a lingual frenulum, and it's going to be connecting the tongue to the uh, lower portions of the mouth. You may have heard the phrase tongue-tied before. Uh, sometimes kids struggle making words and moving their tongue around inside their mouth uh, is a reason for this. And what we will do in a situation where the tongue is sort of held entirely too tightly down to the bottom of the mouth is we'll go and we'll snip 
that lingual frenulum and that frees the tongue up. So that's referred to as being tongue-tied, and the treatment for that is to treatment for that is to cut that lingual frenulum, free the tongue up, tongue up to go about its business and allow you to move it around, forming boluses and uh, making words. Just a neat little, you know, something fascinating. All right, your teeth. Uh, you got 32 um, teeth as an adult, 20 deciduous teeth as a younger person, and your teeth sort of have this general breakdown. All of them have the same basic idea. Uh, there is an enamel upper portion, which is actually the hardest substance that the body makes. Uh, this dentin, this very bone-like below the enamel surface, and then inside it is a living tissue. Uh, we've got this pulp. Now, a very important point to be made here well, hang on, let me stick to the stick to the schedule. Teeth are very important for mechanical breakdown of foods. That's absolutely true. Teeth have a crown and a root, which is absolutely true. Um, if you've ever heard somebody getting a root canal, we're digging down through the tooth to get down into the root to allow for uh, uh, input of, in uh, some cases, antibacterial agents or just let things out, pressure, what have you. We're trying to get in there to clean out um, um, broken down tooth material and allow things to heal as best they can. Now, now, heal is a rough word to use on this. And what I'm trying to get at is this. Dentin, though it is tooth-like, it, I'm sorry, let me rephrase. Dentin, though it is bone-like, it is not bone. Okay, dentin is not bone. Uh, you do not contain osteocytes. There, there are no osteoblastic cells hanging out in here. If you crack a tooth, it's not going to heal. If you have a cavity, it is not going to fix itself. you got to go and get this stuff taken care of post haste. you got to get it done quickly. Uh, a carry or a cavity, a dental carry, uh, is going to be a situation where, uh, as a result of bacterial action, you can have damage to a crown of a tooth, typically. So imagine you get this little gully in a tooth. What you will do is you will release, or let me rephrase, you will go and you'll eat something like chocolate. That chocolate gets into the gaps in your teeth here, and uh, bacteria get in there and they start chowing down on that chocolate, and they release an acidic byproduct of their metabolism, and the acid wears away at your tooth, which makes a bigger hole, which more chocolate gets in, and then bacteria get in there and chow down on it and break the tooth down even further using the releases of acidity uh, from their general metabolism. Uh, this is all a cavity is from bacterial action. So what you got to do is we'll come in with a drill and clean out all the little open areas where the bacteria have set up shop and then we'll fill it in. That's what a filling is. Uh, we will fill it in with an amalgam like a metal material typically and that will keep the tooth from having further decay. And you want to prevent tooth decay because for whatever reason there are pretty strong evidences out there that having bad teeth leads to heart disease directly, all right? Uh, we think it's probably because infl inflammatory chemicals flowing around the bloodstream as a result of damage to the teeth, but all the same, uh, if you are struggling with a lot of tooth-based issues, you gotta get it fixed um, with relative quickness because if you just try to live with it, uh, your risk of heart disease goes up pretty dramatically. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the inside of the mouth. So you have incisors, canines, Premolars and molars. The incisors are up here out front. Uh, the canines are kind of the sharp and pointy ones. Uh, you have premolars, which are sort of getting flat, and then the molars in the back. And I would like for you to know what these do. So your incisors are like to chop off little bits of food so they cut. Uh, your canines are used to lock into a big piece of meat and tear that off, so tearing food to pieces. And then your premolars and molars are going to be used for crushing food with their flat surfaces. In fact, uh, you can look at certain animals, elephants, I believe, are kind of famous amongst these. They don't even have incisors and canines. They just got molars, okay? These big flat teeth, because they're eating plant material. So they get a hold of it, bring it into the mouth, and just grind it up to shreds. They don't have to worry about the snipping or the uh, tearing, if you will, like we do with our omnivorous diet. Now, down here on the tongue, uh, the tongue has a variety of what are called papillae, and these papillae, these little dots you can see here, for instance, will bear taste buds, okay? Now, not all of them do. Your tongue actually has several different types of papillae. You've got, you've got phyloform papillae, phyloform, as you can see, sort of in here. And what these are, they're all over the tongue, uh, not fungiform. The fungiform papillae look like little dots. 
Uh, if you look at a fungiform papillae in cross section, it has the appearance of a mushroom. That's why they call them fungiform. But if you go and you look in a mirror and you stick your tongue out, all the little dots are fungiform papillae. They're going to be bearing um, taste buds. You can see along the sides of the tongue, these foliate papillae, they bear taste buds. Valates across the back, they bear taste buds. But all the rest of the tongue just has this kind of light colored, rough appearance. Those are phyloform papillae and they lack taste buds, okay? So basically what this does is it gives your tongue a rough surface, really high in keratin, toughens it up, uh, and it gives you good friction. Like imagine eating ice cream, you know, you lick the ice cream cone. Uh, it's the friction built from these phyloform papillae whom lack taste buds that allow you to lap up materials in that fashion. Whereas the rest of these taste buds do bear taste I'm sorry, the rest of these papillae do bear taste buds and allow you to taste the foods which you consume. Uh, let's talk a little bit about saliva. I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of detail here, but there are three types of these uh, salivary glands. These are the parotid glands, sublingual glands, and submandibular glands. Uh, and they will produce either a serous or watery secretion or a thick and mucosal secretion. Um, now, why do we produce saliva? Well, it cleanses your mouth. It does contain some, um, um, we call it, enzymes that will assist you with breaking down foods. It certainly does dissolve chemicals that then can move into your taste buds and allow you to perceive taste. Uh, this will help you form your boluses by sticking materials together and getting them a slick coating of mucus so you can swallow them down. All real uh, and worthy of our consideration here is that your saliva is almost entirely water. About 97%. It's a little bit on the acidic side, which is good for being antibacterial. Uh, it, there will be some electrolytes that are released as a result of this. There, again, are some enzymes, mostly amylase, maybe lipase. Um, but importantly are these proteins like lysozyme and even a, a, some immunoglobulins uh, that assist you in defending against pathogens. Yeah, that's enough. All right, uh, the pharynx and the esophagus, just to kind of lay this out here for you. Uh, the pharynx is very important for you bringing a bolus down and dumping it into the pharynx. And what will happen is you will direct those foodstuffs down the esophagus. How does this happen? Uh, the swallowing act is going to have the tongue close off the oral cavity. So when you're trying to swallow, foods can't come back up into the mouth. Uh, your soft palate locks back against the nasopharynx so that nothing can go up into the nasal area, at least it's not supposed to. Uh, and then your um, epiglottis is going to close off the trachea, so the only place foods can go are down your esophagus. And we've already talked about these cartilaginous rings and how they're structured. Uh, I'm simply pointing out to you how this all works. Now, the esophagus itself is guided by peristaltic motion, uh, 25, 30 centimeters in length, and it is very muscular. Okay, very, very muscular. And it's going to carry materials down to the stomach. Is that all I want to say about that? Yeah, I think it is. We'll talk a little bit more about heartburn and things in a bit. All right, so how do we swallow food? It's kind of broken down into two steps. The buckle or voluntary phase. Uh, this is going to be when you uh, use the tongue to form a bolus and move that bolus back to the back of your mouth, moving it back into the pharynx. And then a voluntary phase takes over. Or, I'm sorry. Uh, it's improper. The voluntary phase, we just did that. Then an involuntary phase takes over. Uh, oftentimes, fancy terminology called a pharyngeoesophageal phase. I'm going to say voluntary and involuntary, so that's the way you can expect it from me. Uh, this is a reflex arc. So you can imagine, you can take food and you kind of stick it way back in the back of your throat. But then, when you begin to swallow, it becomes a reflex. Okay? Uh, it is an involuntary act. So material moves down the pharynx, as we described previously, and then down the esophagus. And you can see it clearly. So this critter is chewing some sort of thing, and you can see it moving down the esophagus. Looks almost like a mouse shooting down the length of this. And it's a very short travel time. Again, you have probably, at some stage in your life, uh, consumed a cold fluid, and you could feel it move down your esophagus and hit your stomach. It's quite an interesting feeling. All right, are we happy with that? I feel pretty happy. Uh, I feel like I'm gonna talk about heartburn later, which is sort of where I'm going here. 
So let's just keep on a rolling and see where this gets us. All right, uh, I'm giving you a little bit more detail on the act of swallowing. So your tongue forms this bolus. Uh, that bolus passes into the pharynx, and then we use all of these parts and pieces, tongue, soft palate, epiglottis, to block the various exit points, forcing food down the esophagus. Uh, you have an upper esophageal sphincter that's once the bolus gets past it, it closes the esophagus, so you can then relax your uh, swallowing reflexes. So imagine you can swallow, okay? Put your finger on your Adam's apple and swallow. After just a brief moment post-swallowing, everything goes back to normal. And that's because this upper esophageal sphincter catches that bolus and closes off after it passes. So once the bolus passes the upper part of the esophagus, the esophagus, esophagus is going to close off so nothing can get back up into the oral cavity, uh, unless you're sick. And we'll talk about vomiting later. Uh, so once this has happened, peristalsis takes over and directs that bolus down into the stomach, uh, where a lower esophageal sphincter opens up and allows that bolus entry into the stomach and then closes things back off to prevent backflow from the stomach. All right, speaking of the stomach, let's have a little bit of a conversation. So your stomach is indeed a big muscular sac, uh, and it's quite variable in its size. So normally this thing is gonna be about the diameter of your large intestine, just a few centimeters. Uh, it will only hold about a, a liter, imagine like a, a single liter, a one liter drink. That's its volume at rest. But if you really pack the stomach out, man, the stomach can distend like crazy and get up to about four liters in size. That's two two-liter Coke bottles. Hang on. Two two-liter Coke bottles, all right? Your stomach can take up that much volume given its opportunity. Uh, this thing can expand all the way down to the um, uh, pelvis in some like extreme cases so you can really pack the stomach out in certain situations it's crazy it's a crazy thing all right where am i at i'm in the stomach <laughs> we're talking about the size uh let me just before i go any further i want to talk about the rugae that are inside of here i might even have a slide that talks more about this as i progress and yeah, there's rugae there uh, but I feel like doing it now, so here we go. So the stomach has this crazy ability to expand and go back to a resting state. Uh, when the stomach is empty, it is, has a very wrinkly internal surface. Uh, and the idea is that when the stomach then fills up and expands, this inner lining becomes flat. So rugae are these undulations. So you can see mucosa layer has rugae. These undulations in the surface are very wavy. But when the stomach fills, they become quite flat as the stomach is distended. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that, that'll do, that'll do. All right, uh, let's see, what else do you want to say here? I thought I heard a child out there. Maybe not, let's just keep on going. All right, um, so your stomach is very highly involved in the mechanical breakdown of food particles. So you have that extra layer of muscle in there. Uh, again, normally your um, gastrointestinal tract has a layer of circular muscle and a layer of longitudinal muscle. The stomach adds a third layer of like oblique muscle that sort of strengthens the stomach and really lets it churn food around, really lets it control things. Uh, and this is going to increase its capacity for the mechanical breakup of food particles. Sort of taking that bolus and turning it into a homogenized foodie soup that we call chyme. Okay, so chyme is very important here. Once material sort of gets into the stomach and is, is processed a bit by the stomach, we call that chyme. That's why food might go down as a hamburger, french fries, and a drink. But if you get sick and you throw it up, it all looks like the same stuff. It's because it's being turned into chyme, this homogenized foodie soup. Uh, and it's a byproduct of chemical digestion as well. All right, so we're going to mechanically break foods down here, and we're going to begin chemical digestion, specifically of proteins and fats. Uh, most digestion of chyme happens in the small intestine. I can't say that enough. The small intestine is where digestion really gets going, uh, but the stomach is going to help in this process. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. So, let's see, here's more info on rugae. You can see the undulations in the surface. They will, again, get flat uh, when you consume foods and the stomach distends and then go back to their regular undulating uh, rugae nature. 
uh, between meals. So we got our mucosa, our submucosa, our muscularis, and our serosa. Plain as day, just like everything else as seen here. All right, that'll do. Let's go on to here. So the stomach, it does indeed carry chyme, this partially digested foodie soup. Uh, and very small amounts of material move through the stomach at a given time. Um, when the stomach has processed this material as much as the stomach wants to process it, it lets out little pops of material into the duodenum of your small intestine, only about three milliliters of chyme at a given moment. Uh, and that is because we want small amounts, all right, small amounts of material moving out of the stomach and into the small intestine. Because the smaller amount of material going into the small intestine, the more surface area that is there, the more surface area that can interact with the walls of the intestine, and that's going to increase our ability to A, digest that material chemically, and B, absorb that material into the bloodstream. So you have very small amounts at a time. Uh, when foodstuffs move through your intestinal tract fast, uh, in high volume, you're not breaking it down and you are not uh, absorbing nutrients from it. So we want small amounts at a time moving slowly. Okay, moving slowly. All right, I think that'll do. That's enough on rugae. We need to talk about the gastric glands and gastric juice though. So in the stomach, in that lining, there are a lot of what are called uh, gastric pits. And these gastric pits lead down to gastric glands, okay, gastric glands, and these gastric glands produce a chemical called gastric juice. Now, these are not rugae, these would be lining the rugae, okay? Uh, so rugae are, are macro, they're big, and then these gastric pits are microscopic, you have to have a microscope to see them. Like, these are individual cells here, okay? Uh, typically columnar cells, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, what the heck is gastric juice made by these gastric glands? Well, it contains pepsin, Okay, that's going to help us break down proteins, and it's going to release hydrochloric acid and lots of mucus. So at the top of these glands, they have massive amounts of mucus that are produced, uh, and that mucus kind of coats the inner lining of the stomach, uh, and that helps the inner lining of the stomach not be digested away by things like pepsin and hydrochloric acid. Right, so we're going to release lots of hydrochloric acid, we're going to release uh, pepsin into this, which is a potent anti-protein agent, and uh, then we're going to have all this mucus that seals off the wall of the stomach from the stuff inside the stomach, so as chemical digestion is taking place, it can't destroy the stomach lining itself. I hope that makes sense. Now, inside of the stomach, the pH is incredibly low. You have a really mega acidic environment in there. It's a pH of about 2 as a result of the release of this hydrochloric acid. Uh, and this pH of 2 just mops the floor with bacteria, man. I mean, it tears them to shreds. Uh, so you have very little chance of having bacterial activity post-stomach because of that hydrochloric acid there destroying bacteria. Okay, so very, very little chance of bacterial activity. Now, there are some bacteria that can take that crazy pH, and I'll be talking about those in just a second. Now, you do not absorb materials into the stomach. The stomach is not an absorptive tool. But some chemicals are so good at getting into our bodies, they can pass this crazy mucosal wall and get into the bloodstream through the stomach, and one of the only ones that's able to do this is alcohol. So it's worthy of our mention. Uh, not that I would know, of course. But if you were to take a shot of a good whiskey, it would affect your brain within a minute. All right? It's going to get into the stomach. It's going to pass the walls of the stomach and get into the bloodstream and make its way up to your brain and bring about a psychological effect in very short amounts of time. And that is because alcohol is incredibly good at getting through these mucosal membranes, getting into your bloodstream, and then affecting your uh, brain as a result of this. So it's kind of an interesting little nuance on this. You're normally not supposed to be able to absorb anything through the stomach, but in some rare occasions you can. So just a neat little nuance to this, something fascinating. All right, I'm not going to go into huge detail on these gastric pits and their, their gastric secretions. Um, I will, however, use this slide to point out the parts of the stomach. 
So we have a cardia over here around where the heart would be, uh, a fundus off the front end, it's like a ballooning portion, this enlarged body, an antrum, and then the back end of this is the pylorus. So what you'll have is a sphincter at one end, and then a sphincter at the other, and you'll uh, consume foods, those foodstuffs move into the stomach, and the stomach seals it off using these two sphincters, and then the stomach can churn all that stuff and homogenize it, and then once everything is homogenized, you'll let little squirts of material out into the duodenum through this pyloric sphincter back here in the back. Yeah, pretty happy. All right, uh, you produce about two to three liters of gastric juice in a given day. Uh, and of, of course, this stuff has a really low pH. It's really good at killing bacteria. Uh, built in with this system, not only is there hydrochloric acid, but there is indeed pepsin, uh, lipase, which breaks down lipids, intrinsic factor, which has a very important role we'll talk about here in just a second, and then various chemical messengers which sort of regulate the whole system. So these gastric glands don't just produce hydrochloric acid, they don't just produce pepsin, they produce a whole host of things that are very important for the way in which your stomach functions. So let's go through and just have a little bit of a conversation on these and see where it takes us. All right, first things first. So hydrochloric acid has a variety of functions here. Uh, it, again, as I said previously, it, it is important to uh, your defense against pathogens. That's true. Okay. It does help to break up certain materials uh, and help you produce this chyme, this homogenized fluid, with this crazy acidic environment. That's true. But really, really important for us here is that the, uh, the acidic environment of the stomach activates your digestive enzymes. When I said that your uh, gastric juice also contains things like pepsin, that is not entirely true. You will release a lot of these digestive enzymes in the form of a zymogen, okay? Digestive enzymes created in its inactive uh, form. Now, why would we make a inactive form of pepsin that is then activated by the acidic environment of the stomach. So what we do is in our gastric glands, uh, we have these chief cells and these chief cells will produce pepsinogen. Okay, pepsinogen is an inactivated form of pepsin and that's gonna enter into the gastric gland and leave out into the stomach where it comes into contact with hydrochloric acid and then becomes activated into pepsin. Why would we do that? Why would we have these zymogens? these uh, molecules which are in their inactive form and then they meet a unique environment like again the acidity of the stomach and become activated. Pepsin, wherever it is, pepsin is an incredibly potent catalyst. Okay, It is really, really good at breaking down proteins. And if you're releasing this thing, it's going to destroy the cells uh, that are making it. So once it's made, it'll eat the cell up and tear it to shreds. So, how do you keep from destroying the cells that are making the enzyme? You release them in an inactive form and activate them once they get into a safe environment. So you can imagine, again, that inside of the stomach we have this crazy mucosal lining. You're going to release these zymogens into the lumen of the stomach where they're going to come into contact with this incredibly acidic environment, become activated, and then break down foods chemically. Okay, then do chemical digestion. You want to get them into the stomach where they are safe to do their work so they don't destroy the lining of the stomach itself. Because again, the lining of the stomach has lots and lots of mucus there uh, that prevents damage, or at least it should prevent damage. Yeah, I think that'll do. All right, good. Let's go here. Uh, gastric lipase. So, let's see, what do we want to say? So another factor of uh, the gastric production here of these gastric glands is gastric lipase. So gastric lipase and lingual lipase will play a role, a very small role, in the breakdown of dietary fats in the stomach. But again, most of this is going to be done in the small intestine. The small intestine is where most digestion takes place. But importantly, also released here in these gastric glands is intrinsic factor. Okay? Intrinsic factor. Here is the trick. The quintessential role of the stomach in reality, okay? Like the, the really huge overarching thing that your stomach has to do for you to live from day to day is release intrinsic factor because intrinsic factor helps you absorb B12 in the small intestines. No intrinsic factor, 
no B12. No B12, no hemoglobin, no hemoglobin, no oxygen carrying, no you living anymore. All right? This is incredibly important. Now, your stomach does a lot of things that are good for you, but uh, many of them you could kind of do without. But intrinsic factor in allowing you to then absorb B12 and thus have the ability to build hemoglobin, that is the star of the show in terms of what your stomach does. This is really important at preventing pernicious ane anemia here. All right? So this is an indispensable function of the stomach. Absolutely true. Now, also worthy of mention here, uh, in little kids especially, uh, these gastric glands can also release renin. And what renin does is it helps you coagulate milk. Uh, you may have noticed that like a little bitty kid can uh, drink milk and then you're burping the kid on your shoulder and they puke. And when they puke, it looks like, like weird gooey fluid and little lumps of cottage cheese. And that's because what we're going to do is uh, when you drink that milk, we're going to curdle it very quickly. And renin is what causes that curdling process. Uh, you should pause this video and go look up how they make uh, mozzarella cheese by adding renin to, to milk. It's, it's a very fascinating process, Observe, observing the curdling process. Uh, and our bodies do that too, so we also can release renin. All right, protection of the stomach. Man, let me tell you, uh, the, the stomach has to protect itself. Its number one thing here is that these gastric glands have a mucosal neck. They produce a lot of mucus from goblet cells basically here that are going to be released up into the stomach's lining. So the mucosal coat here is going to line the stomach, give this thick gel of mucus, and that's going to protect the proteins of these epithelial cells that are here and keep them from becoming damaged further. All of the cells here are going to bear tight junctions, and that's going to keep gastric materials from being able to me uh, meander in between cells, so that's very important. And further, these epithelial cells really replace themselves at an incredible rate. So you'll replace your gastric lining about every three to six days as it is damaged. So you're constantly sloughing off these cells and replacing it with fresh cells from below. This is just yet another protective measure uh, allowing your stomach to do what your stomach does. However, there can be cases where you have damage to the stomach wall, and we just gonna, we're just going to call that an ulcer, okay? Uh, where pepsin or the hydrochloric acid erode into and cause damage down into the uh, submucosa, for example, and, and damaging the epithelial lining. So this ulcer is going to bleed, you're going to feel sick, and it's just a terrible feeling, a, a very uncomfortable feeling from the folks that I've talked to who have experienced ulcers. Now, here I want to dispel a myth, and that is the myth of Heliobacter pylori. Heliobacter pylori, for a very long period of time, was thought of as causing ulcers. So if you got an ulcer, it's because you got Heliobacter pylori infections. Heliobacter pylori is a bacterium that can handle the acidity of the stomach. So you can look at the intestine, or I'm sorry, you can look at the stomach of a large subset of the population. I forget the numbers, but I think it's like 25%, and they'll have a Heliobacter pylori um, presence in their stomach. So they exist. For a long time, we thought Helobacter pylori caused ulcers, but we see ulcers with people who have Helobacter pylori, that's true, but we also see ulcers in people that don't have Helobacter pylori infections. We see people who have Helobacter pylori in their, in their stomach, but they don't have any history of stomach ulcers. So does Helobacter pylori cause an ulcer? Maybe? But probably not the way we used to think. So you will be hearing about this in the future, I predict. And you need to realize that it's not as cut and dry as most folks like to make it seem. All right. All right. That was good enough. All right. Uh, do we want to do pancreas and liver and gallbladder? I'm going to say no. I think we need to stop there. Uh, let's save this for a next half of the lecture, if you will. And uh, we'll pick it up from there. All right. Thanks, guys. Hope this is a benefit for you.